So today we're going to talk about a once was in small arms design and production. So if you heard of the Lewis machine gun, Isaac Lewis was a colonel in the U.S. Army. He was a West Point grad, served for 30 years. He was a very prolific and very important designer in the history of small arms. So if you know about his machine gun, the Belgian rattlesnake, as it was so-called, he essentially designed this awesome machine gun that was very mobile, almost less than 30 pounds of the lightest machine guns in World War I, and he took it to the War Department, and it was essentially not accepted because he had a he had some beef with one of the guys who was in charge of the War Department, one of the generals at the time. And because of that, he said, well, you know, if you guys don't want to buy my machine gun, I'll take it to people who will. And he took it to Europe, sold it to the Europeans, to the Belgians and the Brits, and they loved it during World War One. It was very successful and left the United States with horrible, perfunctioning machine guns throughout all of the war, playing catch-up the entire time. So anyways, that was Lewis's light machine gun. What he did with this rifle that you're looking at now is he wanted to create a sort of assault rifle phase sort of thing. And he did this in a number of ways. And we're going to look at the history of how he did this and some of the drawbacks that he had. And really how he created something that was almost, was essentially superior to the Browning automatic rifle in a lot of ways. I mean, we're talking about a detachable magazine piston operated, ambidextrous magazine catch, left hand charge, simple operation with the selector switch, a forward pistol grip that is actually angled. We're talking World War One. we're talking 1916, 1918 here. Combat sights and a long range capability uh, chambered in 30-06. I mean, what you're looking at are features that you would probably say this is much more conducive to rifles in the Second World War than anything before the 1930s. It is extremely advanced for its time period, and yet the BAR was still adopted. I mean, this thing was a pound under the specs. This was a pound under the specs of the original Browning Automatic Rifle Trials Contest. Like, can you believe that? The bar, this bar came in at something like 16 pounds. This was 12 pounds. It didn't even fall within the specification range. The BAR was happening at the same time, which on a caveat, the BAR that we have today is actually a 1918 version, which was a trials BAR that we wanted to show uh, in the video because this would have been going up against a trials BAR, not a BAR of post-World War I or World War II. Anyways, the buttstock you're looking at here was created in World War II as a sort of quick fix for BAR stocks. And you see it's made out of metal and it's got a shop in there. Here I have a uh, regular BAR stock in superimposed on top of the image in order to show you what it probably would have looked like in 1918 as a trials rifle. But bear in mind that this was actually a home guard issued gun and they didn't have enough spare stocks to go around so they created these odd wire things to go there. Pretty, pretty fun, eh? So anyways, this is the Trials BAR from 1918 of a similar of the original bar model that was extremely heavy. You know, this, this is what Lewis's gun would have been going up against. Browning came up with his rifle and he submitted it to the War Department and it looks like it was either sort of military industrial context or it was a bit too much. And the War Department favored the BAR over Lewis's. We've got accounts from 1918 that one of Lewis's friends sent him a letter saying they, they, the War Department, have many Browning guns, the Browning automatic rifle, and contracts for more Brownings are coming in. I don't think your design will sell to the Ordnance Board now, though it seems to be superior to the Browning. We're talking superior in weight. We're talking possibly superior in accuracy. We're talking superior in being able to possibly cool down because of the vents that were being created later down on the barrel. We're talking on a whole number of different phases that this thing was probably better than the BAR. And at the same time, the Browning automatic rifle ended up being adopted. And this rifle is literally consigned to history. It was sort of a very unfortunate turn of events for Lewis, which might, I remind you, this is the same guy who returned $10,000 that the U.S. government gave to him for purchasing his machine gun. He returned it all back because he said, I don't think I need it. Uh, I think the government needs it more than me. This, what you're looking at here is actually the third design iteration of the Lewis Assault Phase Rifle, which is as Lewis wanted to call it. 
There is two others, 1916 and 1917 uh, as well. Initially, it was a 14-pound rifle. Then he got it down to a 13-pound rifle. Then he got it down to a 12-pound rifle. And that's what you're looking at now, which is the final version. So when he first started designing this, one of his quotes is, this one is still in between and betwixt. It's not a rifle, not a machine gun. I'll go back to the design idea I had earlier this year, a light, a light automatic rifle that can be used in the assault by each soldier. And he did that, and he continued on with improving it, and it wasn't even for a uh, trials bit. It was, for, it was because he really wanted you know infantry guys to have something that they could actually assault an enemy with while moving and while have the automatic capability and have a very reliable and very simply operated weapon and something better than in 1903. Bear in mind, this is also two decades before the M1 Grand was even starting to be taken seriously by the U.S. military establishment. So, back to the actual Lewis assault rifle concept here. So, what we're looking at, we're looking at the piston right now. And so, the piston is screwed onto a sort of groove, and that groove can rotate back and forth. The, this groove is located before these sort of fins in the barrel, and these are probably cooling fins invented to keep the barrel shroud away from the barrel doing high rates of fire. The shroud was a, a bit of an interesting bit here, and so that comes off by sliding it off, and it comes in with a pin, and it's pinned to the rifle as well. So you'll notice with operation of the rifle that the entire piston system goes back and forth and that's part of the design here and it's very similar to Lewis also created a pistol at the same time to try to compete with the 1911 Forgotten Weapons has an excellent video on this pistol but you can see that the design is very similar in the design of the bolt as well it is an open bolt weapon system which was probably necessary back then for the high rates of fire being able to not have something cook off in the chamber that's a very important piece there. The rear sights come out of the stock and they fold nicely away inside of them. They have an open peep sight up, they have an open notch up top for quick sight and then a peep sight in the middle for accurate stuff when you bring them up and down. The bolt is left hand charge, which is very innovative for that area. We don't start seeing left hand charge with weapons until later. Ma a selector switch is on the left side and it can be switched to safe, single, and automatic just with the flick of your thumb. In addition, if you if you look at the ambidextrous magazine release, this is an ambidextrous magazine release, something that ambidexterity has not been an issue for a long time. This is something that is very forward thinking. Now with the magazines, it was probably used a curved magazine, but we don't have any of the magazines on file, so we had a BAR magazine to sort of simulate. This is probably what it looked like, but it was around the same dimensions. The takedown portion of the rifle was a bit in the back of the stock, and then there's a trap door portion in the stock as well to allow the use of the cleaning supplies and materials to be put in there. Overall, the rifle was a very sleek design. It was very, it was as compact as it could be given that it was supposed to fill an automatic rifle roll or essentially what we sort of see as, as a magazine-fed light machine gun today, something that the BAR and the SAW have always had issues trying to overcome. And possibly some of the only things it was missing was bipods. I mean, there was no bit on here for bipods that we don't see either. Anyways, thanks guys for watching. I really appreciate the viewership. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is going to be our second to last Royal Armories video. At the same time, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Venturi Munitions. They have been outstanding in providing us support for this channel. Please go give them a click if you can. We'd also like to thank the Royal Armories for being able to come out with us and show us these amazing firearms and be able to bring them to you on our channel. Thank you very much.